My name is Dumitia, and I would like to speak with you today about some of the great achievements of the Roman Empire. Specifically, I will be talking to you about some of the architectural and engineering feats that the Romans were so good at. What I would like you to do is take out a piece of paper and a pen and be, and be ready to take some notes. The notes I would like you to take are on the Colosseum, Roman aqueducts, the Pantheon, the Circus Maximus, and the Arch of Constantine. I would like you to write down as many facts as you hear as I discuss and show you these magnificent structures. So, if you don't mind, please have your pen poised and ready to go. Our first discussion will be about the famed Colosseum. So, here we are at the Colosseum. The Colosseum is also known as the Flavian Amphitheater. It is a round amphitheater in the center of the city of Rome. Built of concrete and stone, it was the largest amphitheater in the Roman Empire and is considered one of the greatest works of the Roman architecture and engineering. It is the largest amphitheater in the world. The Colosseum is located just east of the Roman Forum. Construction began under the Emperor Vespasian in 70 AD and was completed in 80 AD under his successor and heir Titus. Further changes were made during the reign of Domitian. These three emperors are known as the Flavian dynasty and the amphitheater was named in Latin for its association with their family. The Colosseum could hold between 50,000 and 80,000 spectators and was used for gladiatorial contests, public spectacles such as mock sea battles, animal hunts, executions, reenactments of famous battles, and dramas based on classical mythology. The building ceased to be used for entertainment in the early medieval era. The next Roman feature that I wish to speak to you about are the aqueducts. The Romans constructed many aqueducts to bring water from distant sources into their cities and towns, supplying public baths, toilets, fountains, and private households. Wastewater was removed by complex sewage systems and released into nearby bodies of water, keeping the towns clean and free from sewage. Aqueducts moved water through gravity alone, being constructed along a slight downward gradient within pipes of stone, brick, or concrete. Most were buried beneath the ground and followed its contours. Obstructing mountains were circumvented or less often tunneled through. Where valleys or lowlands intervened, the pipe was carried on bridgework or its contents fed into high-pressure lead, ceramic, or stone pipes and siphoned across. Rome's first aqueduct supplied a water fountain at the city's cattle market. By the 3rd century AD, the city had 11 aqueducts, sustaining a population of over a million in a water-extravagant economy. Most of the water supplied the city's many public baths. Most Roman aqueducts proved reliable and durable. Some maintained into the early modern era, and a few are still partly in use today. Our next stop on our tour of Roman architecture is the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a building in Rome that was commissioned by Marcus Agrippa during the reign of Augustus as a temple to all the gods of ancient Rome and rebuilt by the Emperor Hadrian about 126 AD. The building is circular with a porch of large granite Corinthian columns. Almost 2,000 years after it was built, the Pantheon's dome is still the world's largest unreinforced concrete dome. It is one of the best preserved of all Roman buildings. It has been in continuous use throughout its history, and since the 7th century, the Pantheon has been used as a Roman Catholic church, dedicated to St. Mary and the Martyrs, but informally known as Santa Maria della Rotonda. The square in front of the Pantheon is called Piazza della Rotonda. Kind of ironic that a monument dedicated to the Roman gods and goddesses became a Catholic church, eh? 
Our next stop is the circus. The Circus Maximus, that is. The Circus Maximus is an ancient Roman chariot racing stadium and mass entertainment venue located in Rome. It is situated in the valley between the Aventine and Palatine hills. It was the first and largest stadium in ancient Rome and its later empire. It measured 2,037 feet in length and 387 feet wide and could accommodate about 150,000 spectators. In its fully developed form, it became the model for circuses throughout the Roman Empire. The site is now a public park. Events at the circus lasted from one day, or even half-day events, to spectacular multi-venue celebrations held over several days with religious ceremonies and public feasts, horse and chariot racing, athletics, plays and recitals, beast hunts, and gladiator contests. These great events as at the circus began with a flamboyant parade, much like the triumphal processions of the emperors, which marked the purpose of the games and introduced its participants. The last destination on our tour of Roman architecture is the Arch of Constantine. The Arch of Constantine is a triumphal arch in Rome, situated between the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill. It was built by the Roman Senate to commemorate Constantine I's victory over Maxentius. Dedicated in 315, it is one of the last of the existing triumphal arches in Rome. The arch spans the Via Triumphalis, the way taken by the emperors when they entered the city in triumph. The arch is 70 feet high, 85 feet wide, and 24 feet deep. It has three archways. The top is called the attic, and it is made of brickwork that is faced with marble. I hope you have enjoyed our tour of Roman architecture and engineering today. Please, if you've missed anything, go back and write it down again. Remember, you are coming up with as many facts as you can regarding each one of these features. I hope you have a marvelous day!